Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode number 20 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Josh LaRue. Josh, it's good to be back in the studios, and it's even better to be back on this monumental 20th episode anniversary of the show, Josh. Take a bow, bud. 20 episodes. When did we start? It was this year. What month was it? Yeah, it was about... It was about, I want to say like eight or nine months ago is when the yeah. podcast started. This came a long um, way. <laughs> episode number one got about 2.6, I don't know, 2,600 uh, views, I think. Uh, now we're up. We have an episode that had 110,000 views a couple episodes back. Uh, episode number 19 is over 48,000 in a little in like two weeks. And uh, Slash Tracks, uh, the Halloween special, our movie riff uh, show, Season of the Witch actually just exploded on Saturday. It went from like 13,000 views to over 50,000 views within like two hours. So that was uh, something I've never seen before on our channel. So that was just insane. When When you text me that and showed me the photos, it just blew my mind. Yeah, it was just going up like before I could like... Like, I'd refresh, and it'd be up, like, hundreds. So that was crazy. Yeah, I'd never seen any. It's almost like, is YouTube auditing us uh, in a different manner? Because back in the day, when we get audited, they would just hold the views. You wouldn't get any views. Yeah. Uh, and then you'd slowly, incrementally get them uh, after they, like, verified that they weren't bots or fake. But th- for whatever reason, on Saturday, Season of the Witch just, boom, you had 13,000. Okay, now you have 54,000. There you go. <laughs> All within like nine minutes. It was the closest we've ever came to uh, going viral, I think. Yeah, that was great. Great. Yeah. Especially after going a few days at 13,000 and thinking something was wrong. <laughs> well, I, th- you know what I thought? I thought it was like, okay, well, this movie's, you know, just not a, a big draw. And I also kind of thought since we didn't do wraparounds for the episode like we normally do with the whole cast, um, I thought it was a number of things, but it wasn't. It was just it was just as popular as ever, so it was unbelievable. Um, but I want to get back to what we said. You know, last episode we I drank a flaming hot Mountain Dew because we broke fifty thousand on episode number eighteen of the podcast, and I said I would finally drink the Crystal Pepsi you sent me for my birthday. Uh, if we got well, if we when we got to episode number twenty. <laughs> So here we go. Ice cold, ready to go. There we go. So cheers, buddy. There you episodes. go. Clink it. Clink it to the side there, you puke. Oh. There you go. Clink. <laughs> Clink. Clink. <laughs> All right. To 20 episodes. 20 episodes. Oh, I love it. That tastes like 1992 to me. Right, exactly. Squiz- but it's the French Canadian <laughs> version of 1992, because it's crystal cristal. It's cristal, bitch. Yeah, Josh paid like thirty three dollars a bottle to have that shipped uh, over American borders. So we know he's wild about uh, crystal clear Pepsi. Josh is just wild about crystal clear Pepsi. Josh is just wild about twenty episodes. Right now, <laughs> there's no tomorrow. Like every time you open the cap, the song starts playing. So. Oh man, really? <laughs> That's why it costs thirty three dollars. I guess mine when you shipped it to me, the sound box must have been taken out or something in transit. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of the channel business. Okay. All right. So got a little bit of a sponsor tease here. So episode number twenty one of the podcast, uh, we. Josh and I created the business email slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. So if you want to partner with us, if you're a company, if you want to, if you watch the show, you're a fan of the show, you want to leave a comment, you have an idea for an episode, have an idea for a story, tell us something that you liked that we did in a previous episode, tell us something you didn't like. Uh, Anyway, we kind of pushed that really hard. So we pushed the email and we actually got uh, correspondence from a company. And we are going to be sponsored on episode number 21 by Hunt a Killer. Uh, and they are creating uh, murder mystery board games. So Josh and I are going to get into that and uh, showcase them in episode number 21. So thanks to Hunt a Killer for hitting us up on the email. And we look forward to uh, working with you in episode 21. 
Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. We got our uh, box in, and we uh, wanted to play it, but Beth is dyslexic, and because of that, we're on the run from the police right now. We uh, <laughs> we did it backwards. Instead of Hunt a Killer, we killed a hunter. Oh, um, man. So, yeah, I it's hope, a whole mess over here. <laughs> so you killed a hunter. That's good. I hope it's the girl who killed the dog, the husky, when she thought it was a wolf. Did you see that in, that story on social media? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, Plus, that's... She's dumb, dumb of the month for Slash Tracks Network. She's the idiot of the century award winner. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that photo. It made my stomach turn. I love animals. Yes. Um, that really pissed me off. <laughs> um, Josh, uh, let, we were going to talk about reading some emails that we got, but let's not do the whole email. Just... The one email that I kind of wanted to get into was the one that was written specifically to you um, about the person who was thanking you for putting out the audiobooks. Can you tell us just a little bit about that email? Yeah, it was a deaf subscriber to the channel, and they talked about how much they appreciate the audiobooks because um, without me narrating them or somebody narrating them, they would never have access to it because these aren't the kind of books that. Uh, you know, Audible is going to be, you know, be jumping on these old out-of-print books to do audiobooks of them. So uh, they were real thankful for that, and that touched me. That's It makes it all worthwhile, all the work that goes into the narrations. Um, I'm so glad you're able to enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah, that, thanks was, for us. that was a really cool email. Um, you know, I was a little jealous that it was, uh, you know, addressed just to Josh. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh I felt like the third wheel, but uh, I was very proud of Josh and all the, the great things he does on this channel. And before we jump into, we're going to finish the business out real quick, but before we jump into a uh, nice comment, mean comment uh, segment of the show, I want to talk uh, really quick about another email. Um, Johnny Utah, we, Josh and I have been corresponding with him and he's been sending us some really great questions. Uh just a, just a whole variety of questions, and he's a really interesting guy. I mean, he asked me questions about my mom shoplifting at uh, the store. <laughs> he, he asked me questions about if there's any, like, uh, folklore or any, like, murder mysteries uh, in our hometowns and stuff. Um, and I wanted to answer a question right now. Uh, so I'm from I'm originally from Coos Bay, Oregon, which is on the coast. Uh, and to, I'm going to answer the question right now. Yes, there are, there is some folklore. There was a kid named Jeremy Bright uh, from a town called Myrtle Point or Coquille back in the early 80s. And he was actually on, featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. He went to the fair and never, never came home. And they never found him. They don't know what happened to him. There's tons of urban legends around the town about what could have possibly happened. But he's still missing. And it's been over 30 years. So that's one of the kind of folklore stories you know true true life crime that happened down there and there's another gal that um was killed and she was also from coquille um and it was a dateline episode uh and her, anyway her boyfriend uh i think his name was nick mcguffin was originally like tried arrested and convicted of her uh leah freeman of her murder and he was since has been released uh, they overturned the conviction. Um, so, yeah, there's two big-time crime stories from my area. But I just want to touch on that real quick. Um, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta read this real quick because this is like the epitome of the awesomeness that has been hitting the emails. This was Buchanan Baxter. That's it our says, boy. That's him. Yeah, he says, I really enjoy your channel. I subscribed a couple years ago. I initially thought you were some guy uploading audiobooks. I had no idea you did the narrations yourself. I've watched every Slash Tracks with you and Alex throughout the day. I'll randomly think about something you talked about. I think Nuclear Grizzly would be a good name for an energy drink or a cologne marketed to douchebags. <laughs> I, really, I really like when you guys discuss horror movies. You enjoy. It seems like the standard on YouTube is for current creators to pick a movie they didn't like and hash it, or, or bash it, I mean, or pick a movie they enjoyed but nitpick what they didn't like about it or what they would have done differently. What are some of your favorite horror movies and what horror YouTube channels do you guys watch? Thanks, Johnny Utah. Uh, first off, favorite YouTube channel. That's a big honor right there. Thank you. Um, 
I mean, yeah, there's a lot of choice. There's a lot of choices out there, and to be the favorite is incredible. There's a lot of options. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's see. Favorite, my favorite horror movie of all time. I answered this for somebody in the comments. Was Night of the Living Dead, uh, just because you know it changed the whole zombie thing from like voodoo to ghoulish things, <clears throat> and it's just so well made, and it's got such a, you know. It's it's so metaphorical uh, for the times. Uh, They're coming for you, Barbara. And it's crazy because you picked Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. Uh, the, the creators of Night of the Living Dead, the two guys, like, uh, split off and took the rights from the first movie in two different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, the Return of the Living Dead is one creator from, the, from Night of the Living Dead, and George Romero was the other one. Um, Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, he did. He did the Deads, and then uh, the other guy got the Living Dead uh, for the Return of the Living Dead movies. Return I can't of think the, of his name right now. Return but. of the Living Dead is just a masterpiece. Uh, from the soundtrack to the acting, I, I'm involved in all the characters. I don't want them to die. They develop. They take time to develop the story and the characters, which always pays off in a horror movie. One of the biggest issues I have with any horror movie: if you start a movie and you just go for body count. I don't care. I mean, it's at that point, I'm just rooting for the killer at that point to just rack up the numbers because I have no reason to be invested. I don't care if they die or they live, to be honest with you. If you pull the, my emotional heartstrings uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes and you actually invest in your product, then I'm going to care about what happens to uh, the stars of the films. So it doesn't it's not it's not uh, it doesn't take uh, like a Einstein to figure this formula out. <laughs> so. Yeah, just maybe work on that, build the story, build the characters, and horror will become king at the box office once again. As far as favorite YouTube channels, like, uh, I would say, like, Dead Meat uh, is fun sometimes, The Kill Counts, um, Honest Trailers, I can't think of the name of that channel, but I watch those a lot, and yeah. The Pitch Meeting Guy, The Pitch Meeting Guy is hilarious. Um, horror movies, a few I can name off that are, like, my favorites that most people wouldn't talk about are Stir of Echoes, Demon Knight, Event Horizon, and of course, uh, my favorite two Jason flicks are usually the least popular, Jason X and uh, Jason Goes to Hell. Um, do you watch any horror channels, Alex? Oh yeah, Joe Blow. Uh, started out watching Elm Street Radio with Deandra and Paige a long time ago. Um Cinemassacre, uh, the angry video game nerd. Um, and then as far as like just YouTube stuff in general, I listen to a lot of true crime. I listen to a lot of wrestling podcasts. I, I'm part of the cult of uh, Cornette. I like his podcast. I like Solomonster. He's a really, really good wrestling uh, podcaster. Um, Don Tony's okay. Uh, he gets a little bit too like into his own personal uh like connections with the wrestlers and the community a little bit too much for my, I don't know. It's a little skewed, um, but he's pretty good. Don Tony's pretty good. And as far as like true crime, uh, there's this one, <laughs> there's this one true crime podcast. It's called true crime brewery. And it's weird that I like it because the people <laughs> that host it are like in their sixties or seventies. Um, they have a beer, a beer of the week for each episode. And if you know me, I don't drink. Um, but just the, the, they're a married couple, just their, oh. their chemistry, the way that they tell the story, they're like telling a story, um, by a fireside. It just, it just I don't know. It's great. <laughs> it's, I, I'm entertained thoroughly every time. So true crime brewery is pretty good. Um, and as far as like favorite horror movies, uh, what's his name? Johnny Utah is his screen name. What Pat Buchanan? Yeah, um, no, Buchanan Baxter or something. Buchanan Baxter, okay, so he, yeah, not the president. Um, <laughs> Lost Boys, Fright Night, Return of the Living Dead, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream Warriors, Nightmare on Elm Street, the, the original. By the way, Nightmare on Elm Street uh, was released in theaters on November 9th in 1984 today while we're recording, so it's the anniversary. Um, everything. Uh, you know what? I'm a fan. If it's a bad horror movie, I'm probably going to like it. I'm a big fan of going to Walmart, the bargain bins, and buying the $5 DVD compilations. I'll watch any horror movie, any place, anywhere, anytime. I don't give a fuck. I love horror. 
one lost boys question for you. Do I'm you, ready. in fact, still believe? I don't believe as much as he does because he's, <laughs> he's still, still, still going to con- he's still going to conventions in the watched <laughs> with the saxophone with the cod piece <laughs> with the everything. Um, I saw here's a little behind the scenes story about the saxophone guy in Lost Boys. Uh, Joel Schumacher didn't have a lot of time for that character. Like on the script, it's like, hey, they they go to the the boardwalk and then they encounter uh, a guy playing a saxophone or whatever a band. Well, this guy took the role and ran with it. He he created his own outfit for the film. Like, he created that. That was him. Joel Schumacher didn't uh, give him that wardrobe. That was all the saxophone guy. He's 65, still performing that, and with the same gusto and energy and everything. Yeah, so. yeah he does He does a lot of... Um, Seems nice. It? He does a lot of those... Uh, what is it called when you uh, cameos? He does a lot of cameos and they're all, he puts a lot of effort into them, but they're all kind of the same. They all end with him playing the saxophone and talking about how he still believes. So, I mean, that's great. Uh, you know what? Way more successful than we are. And he yes, only did. Yes. Yeah. So he's still in fantastic shape physically. He's really positive. Um, I think he'd be a great guy to have on the show. So saxophone guy from lost boys. If you're watching this episode, you're cordially invited to come on the show because we still believe. And we'd love to enter. We'd love to have a discussion with you. Yeah, sure. getting sidetracked. Let's see what else is going on. What's his fitness routine? What does he eat? Does he play <laughs> saxophone every day? Um, he, has he seen the Sergio SNL skit? Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's have a you lot seen of that? Things. Where the no, guy I, pops out all the time playing the saxophone? Okay. No, I haven't. I haven't watched uh, SNL uh, live other than clips in over 20 years. Oh, this was way back. This was like like first year of Andy Samberg and them. But yeah, it's okay. uh, it's pretty funny. Well, it's, it's pretty much a rip on that. So hey, we're about twenty minutes deep into this episode, and we haven't right, even got it. into the first segment. So let's do this. Nice comment, mean comment, nice comment. But Josh, I'm gonna I'm gonna warn you. We have three nice comments for this okay. episode because we had a lot of really good stuff, and you personally requested one, so yes. I had to squeeze it into the <laughs> format here. All right, Josh. (laughs) Yeah, squeeze it in. Squeeze it out. Uh, Nice comment of the week. Sponsors should be pounding at your door. Very original format. Very entertaining. And that's from Woexy Tare, or Tare, uh, and that is on Slash Tracks News, episode number 19. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And uh, whenever anyone says original uh, format, I really... I really, really take that to heart because it is an original format. And I dare you to find a, a podcast on the internet that talks about horror, pro wrestling, uh, sports, fun facts, weird headlines, uh, audio books that are uh, hard to find, narrated uh, by the 80s slasher librarian. Just, we talk about everything. We run it's the whole semen. gamut here. Lots of semen. Yeah, yeah lots of semen. <laughs> Um, here's a mean comment. So this is the mean comment of the week. Okay. And this one... Is this the this dumb one, one? No, this one annoyed me okay. a little bit. You wannabes just crapped all over a classic great horror movie. Zero out of ten. And that's from the YouTube user... Uh, YouTube name User. So his name is User. And that's regarding <laughs> the Halloween special. Uh, slash Tracks number 31, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Okay, <laughs> classic horror movie there. <laughs> he loves robot witches. He loves, uh, you know, actual nipple suction uh, in places that shouldn't be allowed. Um, he likes terrible deadbeat fathers that don't know how to stop murder sprees, even though he's in the room where he could have just knocked the TV over at the end of the movie. Doesn't even a guy? Yeah, he could have saved the kids at the end. He could have just knocked that TV. Yeah, he's not going to save everybody because he only got the two of the three big networks. But you know, and by the way, back in the mid '80s or early '80s when that film was released, not everybody had cable at that point. Yeah. So the Halloween Company is further flawed with their plan for killing all these kids. <laughs> three costs, three masks. <laughs> yeah, we. I would have been fine. Everything we watched as a kid was basically VCR. Like my dad would tape stuff we enjoyed. When we had sporadic uh, spurts of having cable, yeah. he'd make a full tape of Flintstones. And then, like, when we were broke again or he was out of work or whatever, 
we just watched that Flintstones tape, you know, every day for, <laughs> for like two straight months. You'd mm-hmm. memorize the episodes. Um, here's the next nice comment. It's a pretty good one, Josh. Possibly the best riff you've ever done so far. And I'm anticipating episode number 32. And that's from Farratin Erdell. And that's on uh, episode number 31 slash tracks. Uh, number 31, which I just said, Season of the Witch, Halloween 3. Best riff ever of yeah, all time. And that not only is that awesome, uh, I was going to say someone else also pointed out that our Halloween episode was episode 31. Uh, that was not by design. That was just a happy accident, as you said. Um, on, that's pretty yeah, cool. Episode number 31 on October 31. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, and here's the last nice comment to end the first segment of the show. That was funny. Y'all had me laughing. And it's, uh, y'all had me laughing so hard I farted. And <laughs> that's, that's the one from, I want <laughs> Yeah. And that's from David Kabarov, uh, season Episode number 31, Season of the Witch, Halloween 3. Thank you. We hope you didn't clear the room out of the other viewers, but uh, uh, we appreciate that comment. <laughs> I've never made somebody laugh so hard on a YouTube video where they almost shit their pants, so that's good. Yeah, that's, we that's can a actually, hell of a problem. <laughs> we, if we had a Slash Tracks, like, DVD box set, and you know how they put, like, good comments about, like, from critics on the box yes. set? That would be right above the title. You know, yes. Slash Tracks Season 3, and then his name, and it would say, I laughed so hard, I, I farted. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty good. Yes. Critics agree. Slash Tracks is... <laughs> 100% certified fresh. So fresh, in fact, you'll shit your pants. 9 out of 10 robotic witches recommend this show. <laughs> 9 out of 10 robotic witches crap their pants. <laughs> Watching this episode. Josh, as fun as that comma has been, you know what's even more fun than that, pal? Uh, let's see. Fun facts. Fun facts. Let's do it. All right, all right Josh. You better hold on to your desk right there, buddy. Because okay. I'm going to blow you away. Okay. We're currently speeding through space at approximately 1.3 million miles per hour. Yeah, that's Ah, crazy. Whoa! (laughs) Hold on! How are we even doing the show, man? I know. Hold on to your freaking hat there. Your hair should be blowing in the wind like a freaking Backstreet Boys uh, music video from the (laughs) 90s, dude. Look at you know, hair. it does it does make you think about how tiny we really are, though. It's scary if you think about it. <laughs> Here on this flat Earth. Yeah, it's amazing that we're like not just blown speed. right off the... It's amazing that since we're going 1.3 miles per hour through space, that we're not blown off the side of the flat Earth. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, Josh, did you know that John F. Kennedy's brain has been missing for 55 years? I did know about that, but I didn't learn it until like three or four days ago. From a YouTube short. That's that's it. That, I don't really know the details. Like, they think a family member took it or something? Is that the... I don't know what... I don't know the backstory. I just know the fun fact. Um, part of his brain was missing when he was shot uh, and yeah. assassinated. Because yeah. his head was blown clean off, man. That was a mess. Abracadabra. But, yeah, apparently, like, his brother or something was a senator. Uh, yeah, Bobby. After- Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, and they think that he removed it, uh, like he, he got access to it and got it out of there, just so people wouldn't, I don't know, just a family thing, protect protect his brother, I guess, I don't know. Bobby, Bobby was killed too. Bobby was assassinated as well, they were both killed, and they both had uh, ties to Marilyn Monroe, which is kind of interesting, so they were both banging the same broad in the, back in the day, um, <laughs> and then they're saying that the Kennedys actually had Marilyn Monroe murdered, because she was going to blow the lid off of uh, them having an affair or their potential ties to the mafia. Wow. So she was, yeah, so she was killed or silenced by the Kennedys. So I don't know. I think the um, Kennedys and the Von Erichs had ancestors that, like, made a deal with a crossroads demon, you mm-hmm. know, for, like, uh, power or money or whatever, and their descendants have been paying for it ever since because those are two cursed families man the kennedys and the von erics wait a minute you're saying that the kennedys are cursed they have ultimate power uh infinite money popularity fame political power 
I don't consider that to be cursed. I would say the Vanover family, my family, is cursed. <laughs> I meant with Bro. all the deaths. And like the Bro. Von Erics and all the suicides and stuff. Um, uh, substance abuse uh, people uh, dying of... Uh, you know, diseases and Don't stuff. Make a yeah. deal, make a deal with the Crossroads demon, and yeah. you'll have all that, and your, descend- your descendants will be the ones that pay for it, like the Kennedys and the Von Erichs. So if we make... All so the say, dead ones. They're dead. So, You're alive. So wait a second. <laughs> You're saying if the Vanovers right now, me, and the LaRue's, your family, right now, we make the deal so me and you reap the rewards... But our ancestors will be punished. Our descendants. our descendants will be punished. Well, we won't be around for that, so I'll do that deal. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. Any, any crossroads demons, we're ready. We'll sign. Yeah, yeah, we're fine. Uh, give us a call. Send it, Send us an email at slash tracks2020 at gmail.com, <laughs> any crossroads demons, and uh, we'll look into that offer for, uh, uh, for our souls. A descendant's curse, yeah. Um, and if you want to sponsor the show and you're a Crossroads Demon that happens to have a company or something, you want to get the word out about your uh, deals, uh, your your terrible deals <laughs> uh, for souls and stuff, and you want to sponsor an episode and work together, send us an email at slashtracks2020 at gmail.com. Josh, did you know if a fetus doesn't get enough calcium from its mother, uh, from its mother's diet, it will actually get the calcium from its mother's bones? That's creepy. Little parasites, man, I'm telling you. Well, the mom should be drinking more milk and taking care of the baby, first of all. What's the mom? Is it a 1980s mom like our mom? My, my, like our moms? My mom was like putting Pepsi in my baby bottle and like probably <laughs> smoking and chain smoking and drinking alcohol when I was. Just putting a rubber nipple on the end of like a glass Pepsi bottle or something, you know? There you go. There's, there's photos of me when I'm like three or four. My face is absolutely covered in chocolate. Like she would just <laughs> buy me Hostess cupcakes. I would make an absolute freaking mess of it. I had Pepsi in my bottles. Um, this is before the internet. This is before social media. This is before, I mean, I guarantee she was doing shit she shouldn't have done when she was pregnant <laughs> with me, which would probably explain a lot of my issues to this day. Uh, anxiety and just uh, feelings of inag- inadequacy my entire life. <laughs> probably, probably directly linked to my mom's lack of calcium and uh, overuse of cigarettes and alcohol during my, uh, you know, during the first and second trimester, I'm sure. You know that if children don't get enough stuff they want as they grow, old, grow older, they'll suck all the money from their parents to get it? Yeah, that's a little payback, too. Like, mm. You didn't give me enough calcium. You didn't give me enough uh, support. You didn't come to my baseball and football games, bitch. <laughs> I'm taking it all on the back end. Um, Josh, here's another fun fact. The first official U.S. coin had this motto on it. Mind your business. <laughs> okay. My, mind your manners. Stay in your lane, bitch. Yeah, yeah. Basically. Money is, is going to always be just this mystifying thing to me because it is literally completely based on some person long ago dug a shiny rock out of the ground and said this is is valuable and now it's all about paper based on shiny rocks and that's what makes you successful or not so well, we need more of that we need more shiny rocks for the show we need to upgrade the studio i think we need to get more, <laughs> we need to get studio? more interns yeah more interns uh you know you were a little slow on the draw with the emails earlier uh so we need to get somebody that just pulls it up immediately we need to hire somebody uh, when your hair is not looking as full of life and as bouncy as it should be, we need somebody off camera in a green suit, like where they make video games and they have the little balls all over them so you can't see them in the back, they motion capture, we, yeah. so we can't see them on camera, right? But we'll just see your hair being fluffed in the background <laughs> and teased. You know what I mean? If you want to be an intern, apply at the email. Slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. If you'd like to be an intern and wear a green screen suit with uh, motion capture balls and fluff and tease Josh's hair uh, during a, an actual filming of Slash Tracks podcast, uh, Action News, write us an email. Tell us who you are and why you want to do it. And stay happy, okay? Don't let it bring you down that our entire money system is based on a bunch of people playing pretend about shiny rocks and that our whole existence is really, if you think about it, just a bunch of people playing pretend. It would fall apart if everybody quit playing. It's going to be okay. All right. That being said, 
speaking of shiny rocks, this thing is worth a lot of shiny rocks. In 2018, the world's most expensive bottle of vodka, worth $1.3 million, was stolen, and it was found later on empty on a construction site. Good. There should not be a bottle of anything that's worth $1.3 million, unless it's got a genie that pops out and gives you $1.3 million. What is the... Bo- well, the bottle's got to be worth something, even if the liquid isn't in it anymore, because it, it would be like, hey, this was the bottle that held the <laughs> most expensive vodka ever. It's got to be worth something. See, more playing pretend right there. Just, oh, poof, that's what that's worth. It's like the books I narrate, you know? It's like, huh, I wonder how much uh, Carnival of Maniacs should be going for. Uh, let me let me add up the year. No, it's just $125, you know? People are pulling, they're charging people an arm and a leg on eBay and Amazon, just grabbing prices out of the air. The Halloween novelization, Alex, can go yeah. up over $1,000 on Amazon for a, a fucking book. Well, hey, it's crazy. you're talking like people that don't know what collector's items are worth, Josh. You're talking, you know who I am. You know who you're... Your buddy is here, Josh. You know who your co-host, your partner. Yeah, but you have is. ways of like with toys and stuff. There's a yeah. grading system, but with with these novelizations, that people are just pulling prices out of the air, hoping that they'll get get the price. Take advantage you know of the horror you know fans. Well, you got a Winston with a proton pack for your birthday for me, pal. If you want more goodies like that, you better mind your business. In the words of the first U.S. coin, pal. Hey, one of my first trolls was a eBay Amazon buyer that was pissed that I was doing the books for free. So he's like, "Damn it! Stop! Stop making these expensive, hard to find books available to the masses. You're a <laughs> jerk. What an idiot!" Uh, hey, Josh. Last fun fact of the episode here. Okay. Male alligators have permanent erections. Permanent. They just always have an erection constantly. That's what happens when you don't see a doctor after four hours. That's, dude, that's why they're angry and they're attacking yeah. people. These saltwater crocodiles. No, I don't know really. if you, have you ever had an erection that wouldn't go away uh, after intercourse? I mean, it happens from time to time. Can't what? zip your pants up. Can't no, piss. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like, my like, God. Like Josh. <laughs> Josh. Puberty was horrible for me because I was fat and I wore sweatpants and shorts a lot. So, can't hide a can't hide an erection when you've got sweatpants and shorts on, pal. Uh, mm-hmm. And then whenever I had and it, my erection was on a was like a hairpin trigger. It could get set off for no reason at all. Like I could just be looking at the chalkboard, and yeah. it would have like a word. The teacher's writing a word that starts with S, but you know <laughs> S start sex starts with S. So immediately I'm like, oh, like what, what are we doing here, teach? You know, and then boom, erection. I'm fucked. If anybody pointed it out, all you have to do is be like, oh, I'm not Alex, I'm a male crocodile. <laughs> hey, before we get into sports, I want to do I want to do a dad joke for the episode. Okay. I never do dad jokes. Okay. Okay. How do you know if you've seen an alligator or a crocodile? Because if you saw a crocodile, it's after a while. And if you saw an alligator, it's later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the joke. <laughs> let's let's cleanse our palate with, with some slash track sports. Okay, let's do it. All right. So, Mattress Mac. Have you heard of Mattress Mac in Houston? Yes. At all. Okay, you have it. Mattress Mac is a guy who owns a bunch of mattress stores. He's like 70 years old. Oh, okay. Um, so, he's, he's probably regionally famous. But he's nationally famous now because he bet $10 million on the Astros to win the World Series. Wow. And they did win the World Series. And he just won the largest sports bet legal payout in sports betting history. He won $75 million. Wow. Um, you know how he set that whole thing up? How? He has this promotion at his mattress stores. Uh, so he's like, customers will come in. So if we want a mattress, he's like, Alex, Josh, come in and buy a mattress. If the Astros win, I'll buy you guys your mattress. Okay. But if they lose, you need to pay for your mattress. Right. So he's drumming up all these customers he never would have gotten a million years had he not had this promotion. Well, you know, last year he bet on a certain team to to win and they actually lost. So all these people were on the hook for mattresses, which actually covered his ten million dollars in bets. So he hedged it. It was completely. Wow. Right. It's pretty smart. Well, they won this year. 
So all these Houstonians are getting free mattresses, and Mattress Mac is getting $75 million. It actually worked. He's taking Houston to the mattresses. That's, oh, yeah. that's genius. Yeah. That is genius. Mattress Mac, good for you. Um, he's getting a lot of shiny rocks tonight, buddy. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> Josh. I'm so sad. Um, on the same, uh, so this is kind of a World Series themed uh, sports section. So that was about uh, that one was about the World Series. So Game Three of the World Series, the Phil- last week, the Philadelphia Phillies tied the record with five home runs hit in the same game. So the Phillies cloud nine. Game three, they won it. They hit five home runs. They were up two one in the series. They actually ended up losing the World Series, by the way. So they, that was the height of their success. Game four, right? The very next game. So game three, they set the record for home runs in a game. Game four, that same Phillies team was the second team ever to be no hit in the World Series. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they went from five homers setting the record to being no hit and also tying another record, but a completely different one. Like a worse one. (laughs) Ah, Wow, okay. Crap crap the bed. Um. And then here's... Well, they can go get a new mattress from Mattress, mattress Mac. There. Mattress Mac. There's a clip of Mattress Mac. Uh, there's some fans, like the Phillies had just beaten the Astros, I think, in Game 3. And mattress, mattress Mac is being confronted by fans, and they're like, you're going to lose your bet, blah, 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 you're a piece of crap. And it shows Mattress Mac freaking out and confronting the fans and cussing them out <laughs> and using the F, F-bomb, like, multiple times. Yeah, it's, it's good shit. Um... Here's the last sports story of the episode, Josh. I know you're excited okay. for this. Yeah. F- former MLB star. So this is a former MLB star outfielder, Jose Canseco. First player to ever hit 40 home runs, steal 40 bases in the same season. Recently tweeted. Uh, and he tweeted directly to Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge plays for the Yankees. He's an outfielder. He just broke the American League home run record for home runs in a season. He hit 62. So Aaron Judge is the American League all-time home run champion for one season. Jose Canseco uh, tweeted out, I can still hit a softball further than you can hit a baseball. Anytime (laughs) you want to find out, contact me. Um, Jose Canseco has a, a troubled and checkered past since he retired. He wrote a book called Juiced, which blew the lid off of uh, Major League Baseball, and he basically named names of all the players that use steroids. Uh, He was never sued for being liable because, you know, it was true. And if it's true, it's, yeah. Yeah, that book led to the congressional meetings for MLB in the 2000s, which eventually led to MLB adopting a new, new, tougher, stricter steroid policy. But Jose Canseco is basically a pariah. Uh, People think of him as a snitch. They think of him as a rat. He's staged fights with UFC fighters where he's just trying to get money, um, and he gets his ass kicked in like 10 seconds. Um, Canseco's a buff guy. He's very fit, but he's not a fighter. Um, He's done a lot of weird publicity things, and this just kind of seems like another thing. And Canseco is my favorite baseball player ever. As a kid, I thought... He walked on water, and I still hold him in high regard. But this is not a good look for Jose. He should be congratulating Judge, not not talking about hitting us. He's not going to be able to hit a softball further than the all-time American League home run champion can hit a baseball. That is ridiculous. Yeah. That's you know, ass. I remember, I actually remember whenever he came out about the steroid use in Major League Baseball, and I was, like, shocked. I was like, oh, my God. These guys aren't naturally hitting balls like three ballparks away. (laughs) 600 feet. (laughs) Yeah, it blew my mind. I was like, I thought they were like naturally doing this without any help at all. Yeah, Barry Bonds was routinely hitting balls into the McCovey Cove in San Francisco. (laughs) He's hitting them into. People are getting home run balls by being in a canoe outside of the stadium. They're not even getting the home run balls in the stands. They're out there with a life preserver. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're in the a body a body of water in a canoe with an anchor rowing around looking for a home run ball. It's insane. Um, let's get into slash tracks wrestling. All right, all right. So this is today. This this is breaking news, just like the Nightmare on Elm Street being released today. News. This is fresh wrestling. Can we news. have one roll for our wrestling segments. 
What? We never talk about Logan Paul in wrestling. Is that fair? I don't. Yeah, that's fine. I don't want to talk about Logan Paul. Uh, right. And I don't want to talk about Bad Bunny in wrestling either. Okay, sweet. Awesome. All right. <laughs> but if it's a really good story, we'll talk about it. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. But for the most part, no Logan Paul. Got it. All right. Road Dog, Jesse James, uh, DX member, uh, great on the mic, mid card, mid card guy, Triple H kind of carried his ass around for a long time. Any main event stuff he ever did was probably because he was involved in an angle with Triple H or China or Shawn Michaels. <laughs> anyway, Road Dog today on Twitter made this comment. I don't think Bret Hart was a great wrestler. I think I was better at sports entertaining than Bret was. And wrestling, and in the sport of wrestling, that's where the money is. Sports entertaining, not actually the wrestling. So That's why, that's why Road Dogg is a multiple world heavyweight champion. <laughs> that's, why, that's why when Road Dogg uh, left the WWE for the first time in the late 90s, nobody fucking noticed or cared. <laughs> Oh, Why the hell? No. Really? Oh, you didn't know? Uh, yeah, you then know. I'm gone. <laughs> Nobody's ass told you. Hey, um, why would he? There's a video of him saying he could beat the Rock's ass too, man. I can't. I know I've seen it where he's like being interviewed, and you can't tell if he's trying to joke about it or not. In a real he fight, he said he hated the Rock. Huh? In a real shoot fight? Yeah, he said he hated the Rock when he first came to WWF. And he should have kicked his ass or something. Um, Good he could luck be with, kidding. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> the Rock, um, Dwayne Johnson, I read his autobiography when it came out. There's a story in his <laughs> There's a story in his book where he's at a family function. It, this is like a young Rock. This is like 21, 22-year-old Rock. On NBC. Oh, so, <laughs> somebody insulted one of his family members, and The Rock just jumped the guy's shit and tried to rip his tongue out of his head. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, go go knock on his door, uh, D-O-double-G. Go for yeah. that. Go for he, he tried to rip the guy's tongue out of his head. Um, that sounds like something that Ming, you know, Haku would do. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's in his blood, so. That's, yeah. inc- that's dude, you don't mess with people so, like that. Oh. If they're willing to put their hand in your mouth and knowing you could bite down and they're still trying to rip your tongue out of your head, uh, you got a problem. Um, <laughs> oh, Road you Dog... did <laughs> <laughs> Road Dog is delusional, and I think yeah. the only reason he's commenting on this today is because <laughs> it's also the anniversary of the Montreal Screwjob today. Oh, okay. So Thanks. it's a big story. In relevance. Yeah, but I just think, you know, Road Dog needs to mind his business. And Don't stay in road, <laughs> road Dog just replaced Jeff Jarrett as uh, this, like a not a road agent, but like VP of like talent consultations or whatever the hell, some fluff job that uh, his buddy Triple H gave him. And he replaced Double J, and Double J just signed uh, with AEW and made his appearance on AEW last week. His brother Brad was a hell is was a hell of a worker, like a wrestler. He was, but he was like contracted WCW, and he was just a jobber over there. But he was way better than Road Dog, way better. Road, I will say this about Brian James, the person. He was in the military. He he served his country. He's a he's a very decent human being. He's he's had his own uh, personal struggles with substance abuse. He seems to be a good family man now. Um, he's not in great physical shape. Uh, I will say that I know the two don't really, they don't, they don't go. I'm judging him right now. So he, he could be in a little bit better shape. He is a good family man. He seems to be a good worker uh, outside and inside of the ring. I feel like this is an extremely bad look. And Bret Hart is a five time former WWF world champion when that meant something. Yeah. Um, if you were a world champion for the World Wrestling Federation in the early 90s or the late 80s, you held the belt for quite a while, and you were the guy that they based the entire uh, franchise around. Yep. Road Dog never had the belt, never was, never even sniffed having the world championship. He was there jerking the curtain in the early 90s, mid 90s as Double J's roadie, okay, and then. Him and badass Billy Gunn 
struck lightning in a bottle and became one of the best tag teams ever. Okay. Yeah. Tag team. He was not carrying it by himself. Okay. Why does tag teams quit meaning something? <laughs> yeah. So I thought at the end of it, um, was he ever European champion, or was he just tag champion? I'm sure he probably had a lot of hardcore uh, title shots, probably had some <laughs> European title shots. European was the TV title of WCW. You know, yeah. It's like, uh, cruiser, <laughs> you're the best of the shit wrestlers. <laughs> I'm sure that he had a couple cruiserweight title opportunities, but he probably ate his way out of the cruiserweight pitcher. Yo, uh, yeah. I don't know. I just think that Road Dog needs to stay in his lane. Yeah. Uh, if he wants to talk about Bret Hart, is one thing, but don't don't drag Bret Hart's name under the bus when you don't have to. It, Bret Hart didn't say a thing about Double J. It was totally unwarranted. It was like somebody in our comments talking shit just to talk shit. There's no reason. Bret Hart didn't address Road Dog. It had nothing yeah, to do with anything. Of, there's plenty of stuff to shit on Bret Hart about, but him not being a great champion and a great one of the greatest wrestlers. Yeah, one of the greatest one of them. One of the greatest workers ever. One of the best working right. punches. One of the greatest sellers. Um, he was one of the best storytellers ever. If you hurt his left knee in the storyline, he would be selling the left knee injury the entire uh, time. And even after the match, he'd be selling it. Dude, he's been selling a kick from Goldberg for like 30 years. I mean, he... That's it. You dirty <laughs> bastard. Hey, <laughs> Great segue, by the way, because now they're okay. going to think, yeah, great segue. Now people are going to think that you know the rundown, which you don't, but here you go. Oh. Ryback uh, recently came out and said that he wants to be Goldberg's last match. So do you want Ryback back in the WWE to, to challenge Goldberg one last, you know, one last match for Goldberg with Ryback? Never liked Ryback, thought he was a Goldberg clone to begin with, and I don't think there's a chance in hell that Triple H is going to let him back in WWF. There's some really, really bad blood there. Nuclear heat. Nuclear. Nuclear. Yeah. Like, Ryback dragged Triple H's father-in-law through the mud. Um, I think Ryback was pissed off that he wasn't being used correctly or, or, or paid as much as he felt he should be. He had some... I think the whole Ryback situation was really interesting because when CM Punk was done with his first WWE run, his only WWE run. Um, one, one of his biggest issues was that he kept, he kept having to wrestle Ryback, and Ryback was injuring him, legit, in the ring. And then, and then Ryback called him a pussy and good riddance and all this stuff. Well, Ryback ended up going out the exact same way that CM Punk went out, uh, trashing the front office and talking about how he was wrestling injured and not being paid. Like he went out the exact same way that he dragged CM Punk through the mud for uh, doing on that podcast with Colt Cabana. It's just really interesting. It was like, See, that's, that's the difference between nineties WWF wrestlers and the current ones, you know, in the current ones, just talk shit on the way out the door. The nineties ones try to choke the boss to death in his office during a pay-per-view nails. You know? Yeah, nails. That, that was about a, that was about the Survivor Series payday, by the way. Yeah, like he knew he tried to kill Vince McMahon in his office. People, um, yeah. <laughs> and then nails. Hey, nails tried to like in court say that the reason he tried to at the steroid trial, the reason he tried to choke out Vince McMahon was because Vince McMahon made a sexual pass at him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, which we now I don't I don't know if I doubt that. No. Was Nails a paralegal, uh, first of all? <laughs> no. He was a convict. Okay. He was wearing a big orange jumpsuit. Said DOC on the back. Like, oh, uh, I want to nail you. <laughs> I want to talk about my payday, Vince. And Vince is like, hold on. Hold on one second, pal. Thinking about maybe wanting to have some sex with you before we talk about the Survivor Series. <laughs> you want to know what the Survivor Series is really about? You got to survive this. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't Nails have been like the happiest wrestler in the entire locker room like the character Nails he's a prisoner that's getting out of prison to go beat people up you know he always looks so pissed I'd be happy should if have I been was a baby not having face. to stay should have been a baby face yeah, yeah. I'm out of my cell <laughs> yeah should have been a bit. You know who should have been pissed is Isaac Yankum because back in the 90s when the WWF business like when they were getting rid of the water cooler at Titan Towers. Like, they actually got rid of the water cooler from Titan Towers because they were going broke. 
Uh, that was when Isaac Yankum DDS was running around the WWF <laughs> before he, Glenn Jacobs was Kane. He should have been pissed because yeah. he was probably making way less money wrestling for them than he would have cleaning <laughs> teeth. And extracting, uh, you know, lateral incisors and wisdom teeth. He would have been making way more money as a dentist than as yeah. a wrestler back then. He had rock and theme music, though, man. Well, was it just a drill? Rock. Was it just a drill? Yeah. <laughs> His arch nemesis, Vince, is like, picture this. Picture this. We're going to take the guy who was Bastion Booger. And we're going to turn him. Get it? He's going to be the baby face. He's going to be the... He's going to be Isaac Yankum's uh, kryptonite. We're going to call Fashion Booger Novocaine. <laughs> He's going to be Novocaine. And, and they're going to hate each other because, because you know, uh, Isaac Yankum's trying to drill and hurt people's teeth. But Novocaine is trying to, you know, soothe and, and, and calm the patient down and take the pain away. Right? Well, how do we work? How do we work shit into it, though? <laughs> well, well, He's, because Nails is going to be cornholing Vince in the office okay. <laughs> about his Survivor Series payday, getting screwed over, and then you know all of a sudden the Road Warriors will walk by and they'll be like, "He's got a, he's got a, he's got a shit." <laughs> huh? What's going on in there? And then Vince is like, "Shut the damn door! I'm talking about uh, Nails Sorry. becoming a paralegal." God damn it! Hey, uh, Mick Foley. So this is kind of a sad story. So, and I am in no way surprised by this story, Josh. Okay. Mick Foley recently said that uh, he has muscular, neurological, and skeletal damage. Yeah. And he's quoted as saying, I'm paying a steeper price than I thought imaginable. So when I saw this story about Mick, it didn't surprise me at all because – when I would see Mick doing interviews or or being Santa Claus for Christmas or doing all these great things he does, and he's really well spoke, really well spoken, and extremely well read, um, you'd never know that if you didn't follow Mick, because um, his characters were so you know, mankind was living in a fucking boiler room with pet rats and pulling his hair out and stuff. Um, Mick Foley is very articulate. Um, I wasn't surprised though because I was shocked that he was doing as well as he appeared to be doing physically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I can tell you this. I'm a nobody that got into wrestling on Indie Circuit for like 10 years. I added it up, and I had like right, like probably just shy of 700 matches total. Okay, total. And I'm 38 years old now. I've been out of it since 2010. I did like one match up until 2013, like one each year. Um, WrestleMania. Every, payday. every day... I have to like get my elbow to pop. Um, I have to get my knee to pop. Uh, I've dislocated my left knee like seven times. Uh, and if it doesn't pop, like I can't like bend my knee. It hurts so bad. I have to roll out of bed some days. And that's just being a nobody on the indie circuit. You know, 700 matches total. These guys wrestled like 300 and something matches a year. Mm -hmm. And every time Mick went out there, he put his body through so much more than most wrestlers do. And, that's an understatement. I'm surprised he's walking. Too, yeah, huh? it's that's an understatement. Uh, when yeah. he took the bump through the hell in the cell, um, and his tooth went through his nose, mm. and he's he's been said in interviews that at, when that happened, he doesn't remember finishing the match. He doesn't remember pulling out the tax. He doesn't remember the next bump he took because he took a bump off the top of the cage onto a table before he fell through the cage. Right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, to so he took two huge bumps in that match. Uh, after the second bump, he was out. He doesn't remember pulling the tacks out. He doesn't remember the tooth coming through his nose. Um, so he was on Dream Street for real. I'm sure that Mick probably has one of the most gruesome cases of CTE ever. Um, probably. Yeah, I'm sure he does. I hope he doesn't, but there's no way that he doesn't. And I hope nothing but the best for Mick Foley because he's a wonderful human being. And I hate to see him going through such pain. And uh, I just want the best for the guy. Yeah, I can't I can't even imagine. You know, I no. thought, you know, every year it gets a little worse. Like, I'm not even 40 and I can tell you when it's going to rain without seeing the weather, you know. Yeah. I can't imagine. I'm glad he retired when he did. 
He re- he retired from like 30s, active right? roster daily wrestling when he was in his mid thirties, and yeah. then he came back with TNA and he he made a couple appearances with WWE later on, like WrestleMania twenty, him and The Rock versus uh, Evolution was a great match. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he in no way even needed to make those appearances to be honest no. with you. Um, and I'm he did glad some TNA that- stuff. But yeah, the TNA no, stuff I think is mostly forgettable. Like when he was wrestling Ric Flair in hardcore matches, that was ridiculous. That was absurd. Anything Ric Flair has done past 1996 or 7 never needed to happen. Um, and you know what the saddest – now we're going to talk about Rick real quick. You know what the saddest part about Rick is? He's such a great speaker and he's so charismatic he never had to do anything in the ring after his in ring career was over. Cause he could have been one of the greatest managers or greatest broadcast yeah. uh, broadcasters or announcers or anything. He could have did anything he wanted, but he's so passionate about his in ring work that like you said, he's going to kill himself in the ring. Yeah, his ne- uh, he is going to do one more match. Uh, it's going to be a handicap match. Um, it's going to be a tag match, but it's yeah. still going to be a handicap match. Um, probably when it's over. No, uh, the Ricky Steamboat thing has lit a fire under him for for real people. And you're probably going to hear, what do you think, about six, seven months from now he's going to do it again? Well, he was already getting offers to wrestle again right after his final match. Um, I think think this is the most heel thing Ric Flair has ever done by claiming that this was his final match. It was even on the the ring, uh, what is it called? The, The apron. The ring apron. It was like Ric Flair's last match. It was a Jim Crockett production. I mean, the whole thing was for Rick. Um, I think he's kind of robbing the public here if he says he's going to have another last match. Just like, come on, man. Like, do your podcast. Go back to WWE. You're you're finally back on the entrance of Raw, like the opening uh, segment of Raw for like when they introduce the show and stuff. You're in Triple H's good graces again. Just if you want to be in the business, go be a manager. Like, yeah, don't wrestle look at Jake anymore. Roberts, man, he's a yeah. he's a he, he was an amazing manager. Like he's perfect for it. He so. could be behind the scenes setting matches up and booking stuff. He booked in WCW when he was still very active in the ring. He just, I don't know, man. Um, Do a Royal Rumble surprise entrance or something and get thrown out. You know, there you there's no, your, there's your... <laughs> no, don't even. I don't want him anywhere near the ring. It once you have to wear a T-shirt to the ring, it's over. Like once you can't pull off not wearing a t-shirt you're done um here's the last wrestling story of the episode josh okay uh triple h is reportedly open to a cm punk wwe return oh yeah triple h man he's all about uh putting the business first um so uh, that does not surprise me cm Uh, punk was uh officially fired on his wedding day they faxed him wwe front office faxed him his termination papers on his wedding day that's pretty it, gnarly, Josh. It is. Um, I mean, that's pretty fucked up. But I'm just saying, like, I think Triple H and Shawn Michaels are going to do a lot for WWE and NXT over the next couple years. I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna change some stuff up. They so doesn't mean I'm gonna start watching it, but we'll see. So apparently, uh, Punk and AEW are reportedly in talks regarding a like a contract buyout. So that's kind of would hold up the situation with WWE. Uh, Triple H is open to another uh, run for CM Punk with the company within reason for the right money, uh, creative situation, and just, you know, working environment. So it sounds like Triple H, if CM Punk is kind of on board and he's not asking for the moon and he doesn't want to have, like, full creative control, I think Triple H would bite. Knowing Phil Brooks like we know him, um, I think CM Punk would want full creative control. I think think CM Punk would want to be in the main event picture. Which he probably would be. He probably would be. He's very. He's extremely popular. Um, oh yeah. He's, he's still gonna bring a lot of audience with him. So. Yeah, he's still a really good wrestler. He he. Um, AEW had their their biggest gate ever with CM Punk headlining the pay per view, which is weird because shortly after CM Punk pulled the whole eating a, a a muffin thing with Tony Khan, the owner of AEW, right next to him, and started like bad mouthing. Uh, you know, the, the vice presidents of AEW right in front of Tony Khan, and it was a mess. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he had just, you know, headlined it, one of the biggest pay per views AEW had ever had. But uh, apparently, CM Punk 
has a non-compete clause that could prevent a speedy CM Punk return to WWE. So there's a lot of moving parts to this, and we don't even know if CM Punk is open to a return, and we don't know what the pay would be. We don't know if CM Punk would agree to it. We don't know how long we'd have to wait. And also, CM Punk is currently injured right now. Yeah, he's still yeah. he's still injured. Um, I don't know. Yeah, and he might have he might have missed his window. Honestly, I don't know. I'm trying to see how he would fit into the landscape of WWE right now. And uh, I, I think I AEW think was better for him. One of the biggest issues I would have with that is Cody Rhodes. When Cody Rhodes comes back, I would hate for CM Punk to show up and steal Cody Rhodes' spot or chance for a run with the, with the championship. I think that would be ridiculous. That would be really sad because Cody Rhodes before he got hurt was turning into a freaking legend. Uh, he finished that match, his final match before he got hurt. He was hurt where he tore his, you know, his pack. Yeah, he's turning into grimace. Yeah. He tore his pack and his, his whole arm was purple and red and blue. Uh, Cody Rhodes is like legend status right now. I would hate for C- CM Punk to show up and steal his shine um, yeah. or his spot, but you know what? If CM Punk could fit in and not be a complete asshole behind the scenes like he's been known to do, because CM Punk is he's straight edge. He doesn't bullshit. He'll tell you exactly what he thinks. Um, I admire a lot of things about him, but I also I I don't like that. He he seems to be petty. He seems to hold on to things. He seems to be very combative about things he shouldn't be. And when you hold on to anger or you hold on to like little slights, that doesn't hurt the person that you're mad at. It hurts you. It rots away at you. It's just hurting you. So he, I, I wish he could grow a little bit more as a person. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Like, how's the edge doing over there? Like, is he still competing or? Yeah. He's been hurt on and off. I mean, he's older. He's got an yeah. injury history. Um, he just came back from an injury. He, I, I, <laughs> I believe he's a face again because he was a heel. <laughs> he's he's flipped more than the big show in this recent okay. comeback. Yeah, <laughs> I, I couldn't really tell you, to be honest with you. Um, I hope, listen, we're going to end the wrestling uh, segment on this. Okay. If CM Punk does come back, it'll be a huge deal. It'll pop a huge rating. Um, my question is, how long will the honeymoon last? There you go. Or CM Punk gets pissed and... Uh, you know what I mean? The plume comes off the rose again, or the bloom, or whatever. I'll give it seven months. Let's uh, give us your predictions in the comments. How long would it take CM Punk to pipe bomb his way out of uh, his second uh, tenure in <laughs> WWE? <laughs> I'm saying less than seven months. I'm saying like Ultimate Warrior 1992 comeback. I'm saying like I'm saying like five months, four months. Um, okay. All right, Josh. Let's get into some horror and spooky news, buddy. Let's do it. All right. This is a big one, Josh. I hope you've saved your money recently. Do you have a do you have a large savings account right now? Because you're going to need it. No. Okay. Well, I'm going to yes. beat you to it. I'm going to try to beat you to it then. Okay. There's a vintage Ghoulies Goes to School movie prop monster. So one of the monsters from <laughs> our favorite film, Ghoulies Go to School, is currently up for bid on eBay. The asking price for the buy it now is twenty five hundred dollars, or or there's another option, twenty four easy monthly payments of one hundred and twelve dollars a month. <laughs> so you can buy a Toyota Yaris, or you can buy a screen used Ghoulies Go to School monster, uh, screen used monster. What do you think? Well, I think the entire audience just left the show to rush over to eBay. Um, <laughs> And then stop it, plan. Can't beat that. 24, 24 <laughs> easy monthly payments of only $112. Only. Only $112. The monster. Wow. The monster that's up for, you know, grabs on eBay. Uh, the mouth is wide open. And somebody in the comments said, it looks like the monster has thrush. Because the tongue <laughs> is like, it looks like the tongue is coated with a bunch of white crap. It looks is like it the, the baby t- one. <laughs> I can't remember which one it is. Uh, I just I saw that and I was like, oh my god, how is this up? How is this twenty five hundred dollars? The movie probably didn't even cost twenty five hundred dollars to make. Oh, you wait till Master Evil makes us watch Ghoulies Four. Oh, oh my man. god, can't wait. We're not even puppets in that. It's just you'll see, you'll see. Or Carnosaur Four. 
Raptor. It's just <laughs> reused footage of the first three movies. <laughs> Can't wait for that one either. Maybe we can have Ryan come on and do that episode with us. Yeah, because he's in it too. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the star of Carnosaur 2, our buddy Ryan Johnson. Maybe he can be on uh, the episode of Slash Tracks where we make fun of Raptor. He's actually in the movie, so that'd exactly. be really interesting. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> that would, I don't know that he'd do it, though. I, unless he's got a sense of humor about it. It's like, I, I don't, don't know. I don't know if he's in it, but footage from his movie pops up a lot Like Raptor. Like where he's driving the heister or the like forklift and he's battling <laughs> the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so here we don't normally do this, but here's a horror fun fact. So, okay. Michael McDonald, and everybody kind of knows him from Mad TV. Uh, look what I can do, he's Stuart, you yeah. know. Um, little John. Li- he's Little John in uh, Halloween Kills. Yeah. But he, Michael McDonald, is the only actor ever who has been killed by both Michael Myers on screen. Oh he wow! Is, he is killed as Little John in Halloween Kills, uh-huh. and he's also killed as a security guard in Austin Powers when he's ran over very slowly by <laughs> Austin right. Powers in the yes. hallway. He's like, right. no, <laughs> no. Fun fact to add to that: he's okay. also killed in Carnosaur Two. Or no, he's he's in he's a helicopter pilot in Carnosaur Two. Yeah, and then he's Carn- a police officer that gets killed in Carnosaur Three. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I remember him in Carnosaur Three, not the first Carnosaur. Um, okay, so here's here's the third horror spooky news story. So, uh, on no- okay. so on November first, thirty seven years ago, Freddy's Revenge was released in theaters. So. Huge, huge uh, Slash Tracks episode of ours was Freddy's Revenge. It's actually starting to... What was that? Episode 16? Two. What? No. Oh, Freddy's Revenge. Freddy's Revenge. Yeah. yeah that, that was... Uh, number 16, number 15. No, that, something. It was in the 20s, actually. Okay. That's that's okay. one we did more recently. Yeah. But, but anyway, it was released 37 years ago. On November first, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on Freddy's Revenge real quick. Did did you enjoy that movie? Or I mean, I know we make fun of it quite a bit, and has a lot of homoerotic uh, undertones that they didn't know about uh, when they were making the film. Or maybe you know later on, the guy who wrote the film actually admitted to it. But we don't know if that's yeah hindsight. He's just playing it up, or if he actually meant it. But did you like that movie? Do you enjoy that movie? Yeah, it's not. I mean, I think it's the scariest looking Freddy out of all yeah, of them. I agree. I miss the dream sequence stuff, and then the stuff at the end is really weird, but the special effects are great, like when he burst out of the body. There's a lot of yeah. memorable moments in that one. You've got the body, I've got the brain. That one's, that's one of the most used uh, quotes, too. And you're well, all my children now. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, probably the darkest Freddy that they've had, almost. Um, he, there's, no real, there's no real one-liners or puns. He just wants to kill in this yeah. film. He yeah. wants to take over Jesse's body and kill as many people as he can. The makeup's great. Um, there's Don't some great side on the font at the beginning of the movie because it changes like three times. With the title. Yeah, that's really. I'll tell you, there's two scenes in that film that scared me as a kid. It was the the first one was the school bus going into the desert that scared the shit out of me, and then just a really I've said this before multiple times. Uh, the scene where Jesse is looking down in the basement and Freddie's down there by the furnace. It's just. A really creepy really? image. I don't know why that creeps me out so much. Um, pretty good flick. Probably the best VHS cover of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. It's like Freddy with the claw, and it's like blue and flames, and Freddy's yeah. kind of in front of it. That one always scared the crap out of me when I went to my local video store. Um, it's also, which I mentioned earlier in the episode, it, today is the anniversary of the first Nightmare on Elm Street being released in theaters in 1984. And what are your thoughts on that one, Josh? Uh, it's one of the better ones in the series. The first one always is. Um, I really hate how they couldn't make up their mind if she defeated Freddy or not with the ending. It felt kind of cheap, you know? That's Ro- You can thank Robert Shea for that. Yeah, that's, Ro- that's, that's Robert that's Shea. That's Robert Shea. That's his Um problem. I wish the whole turning your back on him thing could have got brought back at some point. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's in my top three. It's not my favorite of all time, uh, but my, it's in my top three. So, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, the original 1984 classic. Fantastic idea. Um, very good um, practical effects for the most part. Uh, the stairs with the oatmeal mush where Nancy's running up haven't aged that well because yeah. you can see <laughs> where she's going to step, where it is before she steps. Um, that's almost like parakeet on a fishing pole with a string and Freddy's revenge bad. And the scene that takes me out of it every time is the end of the film where the mom, the rubber, the what blow up the, doll. Gets what about the stuff? Door. What about when Freddy gets set on fire and all of a sudden he shrinks like three inches and puts on 40 pounds? Yeah, that was ridiculous, too. <laughs> um, and then, and you're also 100% correct on the ending. Nancy turns her back on Freddy and takes away his energy, which is actually a really great, um, like, kind of a comparison to problems in your everyday life. So yeah. if you have, like, people with obsessive compulsive disorder or if you're really fixated on something and you give en your time and energy to it, it builds up and becomes bigger than it is. But if you decide, like, fuck it, I'm no longer fixating on this, I'm no longer going to give my energy to it, it eventually goes away. I mean, for the most part. Unless yeah. you're really, really bad. Um, but, dead or something. yeah, you can defeat the demons in your life. And I think by Robert Shea wanting to uh, leave the ending kind of open for a sequel, it kind of diminished the vision that Wes Craven originally had because it was supposed to be a standalone film. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, no, it's a good flick. I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the greatest horror movies ever made. Totally the original remake's film. not horrible. The remake's not horrible either. It's just not original they didn't do enough changes to it really i could do um, without all the child molestation josh in the remake i could go i could do without well, that. I mean, the original freddy did that too they just didn't talk about it as much but they, yeah uh allegedly they like Wes craven wrote him but they when at that time when nightmare on Elm street was released there was a lot of there was a like a, a person that ran a daycare was like molesting kids and it was a big story at the time. Yeah. So like they took it out of the film and they never really put it back in, but the undertones were there, but they never directly expressed that. But you kind yeah. of figure we'll, ha we'll have to riff the remake one day. Um, oh, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if master evil, if you're watching, please let's, <laughs> let's make fun of uh nightmare on Elm street, the, the re 2009 remake, that shitter. Um, <laughs> So, Josh, another spooky story for the episode. Production company A24 is developing a Friday the 13th pre-equal series titled Crystal Lake for Peacock. Have you heard about this? No. Yeah, I heard. I'm not interested. I'm just not interested. Uh, Why? The Pamela story is tired. It's... Really, I think the remake that they, the reboot remake of uh, Friday the Thirteenth handled the Pamela story the best by giving it like the first ten minutes of the movie. That's all you really need to know. Like, I, I don't know how much they can really do with the TV series if Jason isn't a part of it. You know, it's... they can have young Jason, but since adult Jason, I think, is tied up in the lawsuit, they yeah. can't. Well, the so lawsuit's they're... over. It's over. They they settled. It's done. I'm not excited about this pre equal for the exact same reasons that you're not excited. If and what are what is the pre equal going to be? What Mrs. Voorhees is punching in and out, going to cook at <laughs> Crystal Lake. Jason's alive and well before he drowns. Like she's just got, going to grocery shop. And like Mr. Christie's there. Everybody's fine. Ralph is you know fine. He's not warning anybody. He's not a complete drunk lunatic running around the town. I know what I know what. She's uh she's gonna be working at the camp part time, but also running a store where you have to with mystical artifacts. The Necronomicon shows up, yeah. Yeah, you have to track down mystical artifacts every episode and break the curse. Uh, you know, like the original Friday the Thirteenth series. I don't know. It just sounds. It, maybe if it was like a mini series, just like a six part thing or something. What the hell uh, are they gonna talk about? It, like, unless Creighton Duke shows up and he's. This is how Creighton Duke gets his backstory. He he kind of works in the kitchen at the campground. This is before he's a bounty hunter. Uh, and he's sticking hot dogs through donut holes with Pamela in the kitchen there. Uh, 
he's kind of like on to Pamela. She's kind of in the dark arts, but he's doing dishes, you know, quietly because he's not a big time bounty hunter yet. And he's on to what's going on, you know, from the start. I think that'd be we need to get Adam Marcus on and pitch that idea to him. Yeah, or if the town was evil, you know, like in the Eric Morris books, like the there's evil in the ground or something. I don't know, but yeah, which it's pointless. It's pointless. I don't understand where they're going to go with it. I don't, but they'll. I'm sure it's going to be something like you just said. The town, like it's going to be like Haddonfield or like Derry or whatever. It's the town. What an original idea. Um, okay, we we we're both poo pooing that, by the way. And yeah. I have one more thing to say on Jason, real quick. Victor Miller and Sean Cunningham, if the lawsuit isn't ended like you said it is, because I hadn't seen that, but if it isn't, they need to end it quickly because if they're fighting over the rights to Jason and they want money and they want to make more films and they want to do whatever, they better make it uh, happen quicker than, you know, sooner rather than later because they're not getting any younger. No. (laughs) So that being said let's go into another movie this is to end the horror section by the way another movie like the first friday the 13th that was made for very little money and made a ton of money uh terrifier 2 art the clowns second uh movie here it's actually his third movie um terrifier and terrifier 2 he was in another film uh before terrifier the original so this is a third time art the clown's been in a, a movie but terrifier 2 was released in theaters on a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget josh and it recently passed ten million dollars at the box office. That's amazing. Horror is in a renaissance. It's coming back. Let's yeah, it, it is. Um, Smile, that movie I was talking to you off camera about, um, was made. It was supposed to be released on Peacock or Paramount or whatever exclusively, and it somehow got a theatrical release, and it's just went over two hundred million dollars on like a two three million dollar budget or something. Yeah. Don't quote me on those numbers, but it went over two hundred million dollars on a very small budget. So. Uh, if you write a good story, develop characters that people care about, you could have a you could have a hit on your hands. Um, mm-hmm. Let's get into some headlines. Let's do it. Head lice it makes my yeah. head itch every time. Okay. <clears throat> hey, at least you didn't butcher that dad joke like I butchered the alligator and crocodile. <laughs> By the way, that's my story on Instagram. Uh, the alligator and crocodile is a story. I added music to it. After a while, crocodile. <laughs> see you later alligator so if you don't follow me on instagram you better hit it better look for alex van over 15 uh on instagram check it out also at this point of the episode we haven't mentioned the business email yet well we you know well for the second part of the episode yet oh, it's been popping up too above our heads a lot oh, has it been has it been yeah. slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com if you want to partner with the show you have questions comments ideas concerns uh, you want to bitch about something we talked about? Do you think the the pre-equal uh, Jason series is going to be good on Peacock? What do you think? Send us an email. We'll write you back when we have time, and uh, we'll cor- we'll do the old school correspondence a little bit. And be sure to join the Patreon. If you like what we do, uh, you can support the channel by joining the Patreon. Uh, the link is on the screen throughout the episode. It's in the description. Uh, we're not able to monetize the channel here because of all the copyright stuff. And... The rules we'd have to play by monetizing mm-hmm. the channel. Yeah. Uh, so Patreon is the only way uh, that we, other than sponsorship, uh, have any income from the channel. So if you enjoy what we do and want to help us out, support the channel, hit up the Patreon. And thank you to all the new Patreon subscribers yes. that joined uh, Patreon in the last month. Uh, we appreciate that big time, and thank you so much. And I said we were going to get into headlines real quick, but I want to talk about one other thing uh, channel related. Josh, okay. we are going through a renaissance. We are blowing up with subscribers. It seems like we're getting two to 300 new subscribers every day. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, I, I haven't even checked it um, since we started, but let's see. Uh, we'll see what the numbers are right now. We're, we, we're approaching 25K. We had <clears throat> less than 22K like two weeks ago. Halloween, man. Halloween is a big time for the channel, and it's not stopping. We, You and I were talking <clears throat> last night before bed, and I said, yeah, we went up, you know, we're over 24,000. And you're like, yeah, yeah, uh, it's great. You know, shut up. I'm in different time zones. Alex, I'm in Arkansas. You're in Oregon. <laughs> you know, go to bed. I said, okay, all right. So I'll see you for the episode tomorrow. And anyway, I wake up, and then all of a sudden we're at 24,200. 
like in yeah. seven hours. We've gained eighty nine since then. So it's still it's still going up, man. That's this incredible. is awesome. That is incredible. Anyway, thank you so much to all the new subscribers. Um, we put in a lot of work into these episodes, and you know we both have full time jobs, families, and we do it because we do it for the fans. We do it for the subscribers, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, so we do it for you guys, uh, and we do it for ourselves because it's a lot of fun, and it's a break from our daily lives. We're not Pamela Voorhees in a kitchen uh, cutting up potatoes all day long with Creighton Duke silently <laughs> watching our asses. Yeah. Uh, first headline of the night. You ready? Ready. All right. Dr. Paul Loons recently deve- uh, delivered a baby in full Joker costume and makeup. And I actually sent you those photos in a text message, so you knew what we were talking about. Did you get those? I did not. Okay. <laughs> I did not get that. So Dr. Paul okay. is dressed up as the Joker from the Dark Knight films, uh, and the doc- <laughs> the obstetri- obstetrician was on duty in full Halloween gear as the Joker when okay. Brittany, when Brittany Salf and her husband Joseph showed up, and Brittany was having a baby. So... Uh, at Henry County Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. So he was he was going to say, hey, Brittany. Uh, yeah, there it is on Josh's phone right there. Hey, Brittany, uh, let me go get cleaned up and changed into actual doctor gear, and uh, we'll deliver this baby. And Brittany and Joseph, her husband, uh, insisted that he stay in full Joker uh, makeup awesome. and gear and deliver the baby. <laughs> so he did it. So and his th- name is Dr. Loon. That's great. Yeah, That's Dr. Great. Loon's. Uh, so anyway, the Joker delivered a baby. So the Joker's not all bad, man. Yeah. yeah, he's doing some good stuff. Did you say the Joker's not all bad, man? He's not all bad. Not all bad, man. Oh, God. There's the third <laughs> dad joke of the night. Uh, let's get into the second headline of the episode. Let's do it. All right. Here's another birth-related episode. <laughs> <laughs> Woman gives birth in a taxi and is billed by the taxi company for giving birth in the taxi. So have, I'm, I'm sure they got a price for that. Like, uh, let's see, section C, number three, fee for, you know, afterbirth cleanup. Are you going to eat the placenta? Oh, yeah? my God, okay. you went there. Um, was oh, the meter, okay. hey, was the meter running when she was giving birth or did well, he stop the know. meter? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Farrah, Loons was on call, though, thankfully. Farah Cockadeen unexpectedly gave birth while on the way for a routine checkup in the back of a taxi. She was then billed for the taxi's cleanup. So she was billed like $100 U.S. Uh, because this took part in, Ber- this happened in Berkshire, U.K., so the United okay. Kingdom. So anyway, she paid for the taxi cab ride. No no clue if the meter was running. So we don't know if she was <laughs> billed for, you know, giving birth you know, the time it took to give birth. So I don't know if she was really trying to hit that Lamaze fast because if the meter's <laughs> on, she wants to get that baby in and out. But she was also billed for the cleanup. So, Josh, what's your thoughts on her being billed for the cleanup of the taxi? Uh, I feel like they probably had a list of, you know, certain fees and stuff for situations because that's that can't be the first time. And with a last name like that, she'll probably be doing it again soon. Yeah. Oh, oh giving, birth, giving birth again. Um, hey man, we, we're at that point of the episode. We're at the last story of the show. Awesome! This guy can yeah. like finally put his gun down when we're done. So. <laughs> Doctor Master Evil, <laughs> his arm is getting tired. I feel Master, bad, <laughs> Master Evil. You guys are going to do the episode. You're going to pretend like you like it. Um, October twenty ninth, nineteen eighty nine. Over thirty three years ago, Nintendo released the Power Glove. Did you have the Power Glove, Josh, or were you a poor no, kid I like did me? Not, I did not have the retro Wiimote, no. Uh, but Freddy Krueger did, bitch! And they didn't even get sued. Uh, New Line didn't even get sued. Yeah, no. Uh, they were going to like be more Nintendo about it, but they changed it. Cause, uh, and they were told no by Nintendo, and they did it anyways. They just they just changed up some dialogue. Yeah, uh, they, Bob, they kept Bob. there, got the power. Bob Shea just didn't give a shit about anybody's opinions about anything but his own. So Wes Craven's like, you know, I wrote this idea for this dream demon. And yeah, he kills all these kids in their sleep and you turn your back on him finally and he goes away. And Bob Shea's like, nope, 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 nope. Uh, That's not going to happen. 
And then Nintendo's like, no, you cannot use the power glove on a child molesting dream demon. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and Bob Shea's like, nah, you got to do it. Uh, Hogan worked with Bob Shea. Hulk Hogan, he's like, that doesn't work for me, bro. Yeah, that doesn't work for me, brother. Uh, no. Power glove's going in, dude. <laughs> no power do. glove is going over, dude. Um, <laughs> two thoughts about the power glove before we end the episode. The first one is the movie The Wizard. That was a Nintendo propaganda movie starring Fred Savage, where his brother runs away to California, and Fred Savage meets up with a trucker's daughter, uh, and they work their way hustling people, playing video games at arcades, and make enough money to make it to the big Nintendo tournament. Uh, isn't it in... Vegas or something? Something like that. The Nintendo Championships, yeah. Anyway, his brother's, like, autistic, I think. Or he's, like, Rain Man, kind of. And he's just a genius at playing Nintendo. Yeah. That was the first time I ever saw the Power Glove because one of the the villains, Lucas, one of the rich kids, they go to play Nintendo at his house. He has the Power Glove, and he says, the Power Glove, it's so bad. Like, so he... (laughs) Yeah, I saw the power glove, and I'm like, first of all, this kid is way more handsome than I'll ever be, and this fucker has a power glove. And number two, the power glove didn't work. The The AI, the technology didn't work. It was motion control ahead of motion control, and like, yeah. it was kind of like the robot, which I also never had and always and wanted. Robbie the robot didn't work Yeah, either. it just worked. It just worked with like one or two games, and even then it wasn't very good the super was, scope came out for the super nintendo it didn't work very good <laughs> it was worse than playing a racing game with an actual controller because it like had lag on a yeah uh yeah so the power glove looked great played like shit um who rocked it ash ash versus the evil dead tv show does he uh, wear the power glove in that tv show they make him a, a new hand out of a power glove yeah um cool. Cool. But the Power Glove, uh, it's very collectible to this day. Um, people that collect game gaming consoles and Nintendo products, uh, the Power Glove and Robbie the Robot, like Josh said, is a very popular item. Not re- not a you don't see a lot of Power Gloves at game stores. I, I honestly think I may have seen one Power Glove in my entire life in person. Yeah, me too. I think, and it was at a game store a long time ago. Yeah, it was like two hundred and ninety nine dollars or some shit. It was crazy. Yeah, crazy you don't. High. You don't see power gloves a lot. Um, Josh, so we're going to end the episode. That's that's all she wrote, folks. Do you have anything to say before we wrap this sucker up? Uh, be sure to hit the Patreon up if you want to support the channel. Uh, send us an email at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com. Anything, uh, sponsorship. Uh, if you want to just yell at us, tell us we're doing a good job, tell us we're doing a bad job. You know, ask personal questions. Uh, we'll uh, We'll answer if we can. Yeah. Um, Be excellent to each other and good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. Say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. And thank you to the new Patreons, the new subscribers. And episode number 21, Hunt a Killer is sponsoring us. So be on the lookout for that. Yes. Where's that Mahalo? Mahalo, dog. Oh, oh, one more thing. See you later, alligator. After a while, crocodile. spotted an alligator or a crocodile how well if (laughs) if you see the alligator uh you you probably saw him after a while uh or excuse me yeah after a while (laughs) but if you see if but if you saw it uh, (laughs) but if you see an alligator wait oh my god i blew that you're gonna have to cut this can we cut this right here no no please no no tell the alligator hey you're cutting that. You're not leaving that shit in. I'll leave it in there. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll make it just as cringy on my end so we can leave it all.
if we were characters in The Walking Dead and we became a book series, mm-hmm. would Norman read us? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this, yeah, that's where, dude, I, I try to tell the crocodile and the alligator joke and like 10,000 people just clicked off the episode. No. Uh, hey.